It can be called New England's underwater Pompeii. In the 1930s, the towns of the Swift River Valley of Massachusetts were destroyed and the valley flooded to create a reservoir, the Quabbin Reservoir. No one knew what was left of these towns. Now, a team of professionals consisting of researchers from nearby University of Massachusetts, members of the Massachusetts State Police dive team, and Metropolitan District Commission Rangers have joined together to explore the waters of Quabbin Reservoir. This is really the first underwater survey of this body of water. This body of water is a Boston drinking supply, and yet no divers have ever explored the bottom to say what's here. Because just sampling it from the surface, you miss all kinds of things. We were very lucky we were able to set up a collaboration with the State Police Underwater Recovery Team, the MDC Rangers, and the University of Massachusetts to sort of everybody working together and everybody getting something different from it to explore this body. And uh, it's been very fruitful. Native Americans lived in the valley for thousands of years. In fact, the Quabbin was named for a local Native American chief called Nani Quabbin, which means well-watered place. In the 1730s, the first English colonists settled in the valley, clearing the ancient forest of great oaks, chestnuts, and white pines. By the time of the American Civil War, prosperous towns, villages, and farms filled the valley. Classic New England architecture characterized the valley's villages and farms. Very often the houses were large, comfortable, and well-maintained. Every community had a main street with stores and a post office, and a common, an open green space planted with graceful elms and sugar maples. The common was the spiritual heart of the village. Churches faced the common. Cemeteries backed the churches. I uh, was born in uh, uh, Greenwich in 1923. My father was the postmaster. My father also owned the general store. There was no electricity in Greenwich. He had a regular uh, privy. It was an indoor privy, but no plumbing. And we had a stove uh, uh, and a woodshed. It was a kind of nice resort area. The whole. Uh, the whole valley was uh, peppered with uh, summer camps. It was a gorgeous place. There's not many of us left. We used to uh, have a hill up back of our door that we used to slide in winter time. And we used to, when the ice was safe, we used to go skating at the mill pond, where that's below where the school was. So we had all kinds of stuff in the winter time. Noon hour, hot, hot day. There's only six of us in the school, and it was all boys. We used to run like crazy, jump in a river down there, and go skinny dipping for a few minutes, and go back to school. The idea of flooding the valley for a reservoir was first suggested in the 1890s. As the decades passed and Boston's population grew, there was always a need for more water. In 1927, the state legislature condemned the Swift River Valley. It would become Boston's water supply, Quabbin Reservoir. By the 1930s, the end was near. Mills and factories that had employed people for over a hundred years were torn down and burned. Railroad lines and bridges were dismantled, roads closed. The entire area that would be submerged was stripped of homes, trees, and brush. 39 square miles. The entire area to be flooded by the reservoir had to be cleared of vegetation. Small sawmills were set up in the valley to harvest the marketable timber. Loggers converted quabbin trees into lumber to build the reservoir. 
brushy, overgrown farmland covered much of the valley. Bulldozers with special blades worked to uproot the trees and scrape the land clean. Then came the fires. Bulldozers pushed up great piles of brush and treetops. Fires burned throughout the valley. From a distance, it seemed a battle was being fought. Plumes of gray smoke marked the remains of farms and villages. People's memories literally went up in flames. The Swift River Valley was on fire for months. A green and fertile valley became a blackened and charred lake basin. Construction of two earthen dams, the Goodnow Dyke and Windsor Dam began in 1933 and 1935. Each dam consists of a core wall of concrete caissons buried under millions of cubic yards of earthen fill. Each dam is over 2,000 feet long. When completed, the dams impounded over 400 billion gallons of water. To move the water from Quabbin toward Boston, workers tunneled a 24-mile aqueduct through the bedrock. The tunnel was excavated from headings at the bottom of 12 construction shafts. The deepest shaft penetrated 565 feet below ground. At the time, the Quabbin Aqueduct was one of the longest tunnels in the world. The construction of the reservoir took place during the worst years of the Great Depression. At its peak, the project gave employment to over 3,000 men. Paying the high wage of 62 and a half cents per hour, the jobs were a boon to the unemployed. Of course, political patronage played an important part in who got these Depression-era jobs. Of course, James Michael Curley, the notorious Boston Paul politician, was governor in 1935 and 36 during a key part of the construction phase of this project. He had money appropriated for a large brush cutting project in the basin of the future reservoir so that many, many of his constituents from Boston, mostly unemployed of course, were brought out to the Quabbin area. Many of them were housed in Ware and Palmer and Belchertown and such nearby uh, and they would ride out to work in the valley to be brush cutters, many of whom had no clue as to how to do brush cutting. When they got paid on Friday, we'd go cash their paychecks and get drunk in the local bars and wear a palmer and sometimes cause trouble, get arrested. The, the, um, there were many, many more court cases in, in the, during that period, 1936, when this was going on in, in, in the Ware Court and such because of these uh, quote-unquote hooligans from Boston, as many of the locals referred to them, or woodpeckers was another derogatory term for them because most of them really weren't that efficient. People came from all over looking for jobs, not knowing whether they could get a job or not. They just heard there were jobs. I remember many men walking up past my mother's uh, little uh, hot dog stand on their way up to Shaft 12, look for work. And she fed a lot of these people. They were, they were hungry. You know, they'd come in and she'd, they'd, they'd ask for anything, and she didn't charge them could tell they were desperate. By 1939, the water began to rise. Swamps and marshes disappeared underwater. Rivers overflowed their banks and became lakes. The lakes merged with other lakes. Mountains, which once characterized the valley scenery, slowly transformed into islands in a vast freshwater lake. As the waters rose, towns, farms, cemeteries, all vanished, all underwater. But what remained of these communities? No one really knew. There's a lot of myths about the Quabbin. One of the myths was that, uh, first of all, the towns were intact, and we would dive down here, we would find church steeples just beneath the surface of the water. And the other myth was that the, uh, the towns were so destroyed and bulldozed that we'd find absolutely nothing down here. And then the third myth, that there'd be no life here of any interest because the, waterway, the water itself was only 16 years old. So there'd be nothing here of interest. It turns out they're all wrong. On this particular site here, we're, we're over the town of Enfield. And Enfield was the richest town of the Quabbin. Enfield begins really at the water's edge. And you can actually see the roads to the side going into the water. 
and then it disappears to about 120 feet. It's in a uh, valley, very steep valley. The yellow float marks the location of Main Street in Enfield. Only divers can visit the town now. They followed the line into the dark depths of the reservoir. Enfield will soon have its first human visitors in over 60 years. Only the cut stumps of its shade trees mark the site of Main Street. In 1916, Enfield citizens celebrated the town's centennial. American flags and patriotic bunting decorated the buildings. Floats constructed by the various town organizations were paraded down Main Street on that sunny day. Enfield will never have a bicentennial celebration. Divers discover a depression full of leaves. It turns out to be an old well with its rusty pump pipe still in place. A gray cloud of water mold floats on the rotting leaves. The Congregational Church of Enfield dated from 1786 and was the oldest church in town. It had served the community for generations. Vandals burned the church on August 1st, 1936, just nine days short of its 150th anniversary. Woodpeckers burned the church in Enfield early one morning, and I was burning brush, like I told you, and we got the call to run down there, but when we got down there, the church bell from the church steeple came down right through the church into the cellar. Nothing that we could do, just watch. Burned the Grange Hall and Parsonage and three buildings. There is not much left to see. Just a few stones outline the church's foundation site. Enfield's town hall was the last building standing in the Swift River Valley. To commemorate the end of the town, the firemen of Enfield sponsored a farewell ball on April 27, 1938. The festivities included two bands, dancing, and a vaudeville show. To keep sadness to a minimum, the firemen served free beer in the cellar. More people attended the ball than ever lived in Enfield. At midnight, the town's legal existence came to an end. Desolation now characterizes the town hall site. Only scattered bricks and granite lintels mark the location of the largest brick building in the Swift River Valley. The heart of Old Enfield remains unexplored. The water is over 100 feet deep, and a blanket of sediment has covered much of the town's ruins. The bottom of the Quabbin is very much like diving in the moon. It's just a lunar scape. I mean, the bottom is just totally empty. Most of these environments, except for if you find a little pocket where a town was, most of these environments, you just jump in the water. What you'd see is you'd be diving on a 60-year-old pasture that's 100 feet under the water with a bunch of tree stumps sticking up, all covered in about six inches of sediment. Although old maps are important, often other clues help the divers find the lost towns. An old photograph linked the past with the present. In 1936, construction began on a stone baffled dam behind the Greenwich Village store and post office. Old gasoline pumps stand near the road. Over 60 years later, Greenwich Village has completely disappeared under 70 feet of water. Although the area to search is still large, eventually Greenwich Village is found. A hitching post stands in front of an old foundation. Horses once were tied to the iron ring atop the post. Now the ring is a mass of rust. Stones outline old foundations along the eroded riverbank. A rusty drum may mark the site of the old mobile gas station. East of the Baffle Dam, divers find a bridge with a curious name, Hell Huddle Bridge. Hell Huddle Bridge was pointed out to us by one of the rangers. 
who said that occasionally this bridge structure would come out of the water whenever the reservoir was low. The pier is massive. It looks like a megalithic monument rather than something built recently. The bridge itself sits in part of the reservoir that has a lot of nutrients entering into it. And so therefore, there's a lot of algae and a lot of life growing in the reservoir, which makes the water very cloudy. On the stones are all sorts of invertebrates, colonies, bryozoans. All kinds of life are using the old bridge as a home. Hell Huddle Bridge was part of the Swift River road system. Along the shore, these old roads still vanish into the water. These roads link the Swift River Valley towns with the rest of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The forest is slowly reclaiming the highways that model T Fords and horse-drawn buggies once traveled. Underwater, the roads hide beneath several inches of brown sediment, but the divers soon learn what clues to search for. By the time the water filled the reservoir, the roads had been neglected for decades. New England's winters destroy asphalt roads. Cycles of freezing and thawing slowly break them up. Underwater, the edges of the road show this damage. Chunks of cracked and split asphalt seem to flow from the road's edge. The cracked and potholed roads descend deep into the reservoir. Small mouth bass have discovered that potholes can easily be turned into nests. The fish sweep out the sediment and have ready-made spawning sites in the road's gravel subsurface. Sometimes, the roads have high retaining walls made of field stones. Where a road was built along a hillside, the walls can be massive, six to 10 feet high. Now these walls provide homes to fish that use the spaces between the rocks for cover. We've done a lot of diving in the Connecticut River, and when we first got to the Quabbin, it was really a surprise. Because first of all, the Quabbin is fishless in comparison to the Connecticut River. In the Connecticut River, every time you dive, you always see fish all around you. Here, most of the dives, we wouldn't see a single fish. The only time we see fish in this, in this reservoir is when we run into human structures. In fact, the fish are almost diagnostic. If you start seeing a lot of fish in a water column, you're very likely near some sort of a wreck or of a building or a bridge or something. Here and there, culverts are found. Where the old roads eroded, culvert pipes lie exposed on the old road beds. The culverts mark where long forgotten streams and brooks once flowed under the roads. New England homes in the 1800s often were surrounded by white picket fences. Granite posts supported these fences that were attached to the granite with iron bolts. Now the bolts are masses of rust. The fragile bolts literally dissolve when touched. Rows of granite posts also mark the sides of the roads in some places. Perhaps these posts supported guardrails. Most homes in the Swift River Valley were wooden. The cellar had a dirt floor and fieldstone sidewalls topped with granite sill blocks. Now only the outlines of the stone cellar walls break through the sediment. The cellars have filled in and the buildings vanished. It is hard to believe anyone ever lived here. Occasionally, poignant reminders of the past inhabitants are found. An old plate catches a diver's imagination. Fragments of a wine bottle lie scattered near a stone wall. Near some foundations, broken beer bottles and whiskey flasks litter the bottom perhaps evidence of a past owner's pleasures. Almost all of the house foundations are of field stone, but occasionally the divers find cement structures. This cement foundation may have been for a farm building. The stairs once led to someone's home. Children probably played on the steps in summer. Some foundations still have the skeletons of shrubs preserved underwater. The black clump of stems may have been a lilac bush growing at the corner of the house. During the evictions, 
families often dug up their flowers and shrubs and replanted them at new homesteads. Every house had a well. Often the wells are lined with bricks. Stone walls crisscross the landscape everywhere. For over a century, farmers cleared their fields of rocks and built miles of walls. Now the farmers are dead, the fields are gone, but the walls remain, mute reminders to Yankee tenacity, hard work, and sprained backs. Although many people lost their homes with the destruction of the Swift River Valley, for some, it was an opportunity to make a profit. Two Springfield industrialists, Dugan and Maha, uh, they came in around 1925 and they purchased a farm and land between Curtis Hill and Curtis Pond. John J. Duggan and Thomas F. Mahar purchased a 163-acre farm for $6,850. On a pleasant rocky knoll overlooking a pasture, Duggan and Mahar soon began construction of an attractive stone lodge. Completed in 1926, this building became the clubhouse of the notorious Dugmar Golf Course. Just one year later, the state legislature passed an act confirming the destruction of the Swift River Valley for the reservoir. The town of Greenwich would be flooded. The project was in its initial stages when they purchased this, so they knew the Quabbin Reservoir was coming, let us say. And when the time came to put an appraisal figure on it, they apparently tried to suborn the local assessors to value their property at a lot higher than what it was worth. And they ended up asking for a half million dollars for it. Uh, included in the property besides the original farmstead and the farmland and the golf course and the stone clubhouse, uh, they laid out a paper subdivision going up and down hills and through swamps and such to try to add value to this property. While other residents of the valley faced eviction and watched their homes burn, the Dugmar developers kept planning and building. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts confiscated the Dugmar property in 1933. The entrepreneurs, Duggan and Mahar, offered the land and buildings to the state for $436,500. They claimed that their improvements had greatly enhanced the property's value. The uh, country club on Curtis Island, the remains of it, that's the only standing building in the whole Quabbin Preservation. We dove in front of the country club, but we found where the remains of the buildings. In fact, we were diving on the golf course. And the golf course today doesn't have grass, but it's just a field of green algae. The golf course and its improvements are now underwater in a shallow section of the reservoir, covered by 35 to 40 feet of water. On the flooded course, smallmouth bass hunt for food on the greens and in the sand traps. Built upon a sandy pasture, the golf course required over 8,000 feet of piping for watering. The lead pipes still poke through the sediment in places. Divers search for the remains of buildings that stood near the fairways. Strange excavations underwater expose the corner of a stone foundation. The divers wonder who or what did the digging. Pieces of a tile flue lie near the foundation, along with some bricks scattered on the bottom. A chimney collapsed here beside the building. Electrification was an improvement listed by the Dugmar developers. Divers find the concrete footing of a light pole. The Dugmar golf course boasted a spacious terrace or piazza, a place where golfers and guests could relax over drinks after nine holes. You can imagine people sitting on this terrace, sipping martinis after a, a golf round. That was, uh, that was quite the place. It was uh, a little notorious because they used to, I think there was a lot of booze flowing up there during, during the Prohibition. People would ride up the railroad from Springfield up into Greenwich to go to the course. Um, I'm told that some of the 
gentlemen who did use it mostly again from the Springfield area would sometimes bring their wives up for the weekend, sometimes they'd bring other women. And that even though prohibition was going on at the time, that there seemed to be no lack of uh, good things to drink there. Uh, some of the local boys got to be caddies for the golfers and they said they often received fairly substantial tips for those days, particularly in the late 1920s, uh, from these Springfield Big Shots, as at least one of them referred to specifically. The state confiscated the Dagmar Golf Course in 1933. The legal debate over its value lasted until 1937. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts ultimately paid $179,000 for the property, which came to $1,100 per acre for land and buildings. Nearby landowners received an average payment of $100 per acre. The Dugmar was a good investment, considering that 1933 was the worst year in the Depression. For the divers, it is time to leave the Dugmar. Air is getting low. Goodbye to an underwater golf course that the state bought for $20,000 per hole. The lost towns of the Quabman pass by below as the boats speed home. The forested shore looks uninhabited, and from a distance, it seems a trackless wilderness. Seventy years ago, farms dotted the hillside. The forests hide cellar holes and stone walls. On land and in the water, Quabbin carries the scars of man's presence. In addition to transforming a valley that was home to 2,500 living residents, the Quabbin engineers had to locate and move 7,500 deceased residents as well. There were 34 cemeteries in the valley, 13 of which are now underwater. Exhumations began in 1932 and continued throughout the decade. A hearse carried each box individually for interment outside the watershed in Quabbin Memorial Park Cemetery. In most cases, even the tombstones were pulled up and reset. Relatives could have their relatives that were dug up and moved, delivered any cemetery in the United States, but they had to make arrangements with the MDC to be at the cemetery at the proper day and the proper time. And if they missed, they brought the uh, caskets back and buried them in Quabbin Park. The Congregational Church of Enfield built its cemetery on a hillside north of the town. The upper boundary is above water and marked by a row of granite posts in the forest. As the exploration of Enfield Cemetery begins, State police cruisers from different parts of the state arrive with the dive team members. Divers make last minute gear checks before descending to the old burying ground. Yeah, that's it. As soon as we hit the bottom, they ran into a wall that backed the end of the cemetery. I knew it was a cemetery because one of the divers picked up a piece of marble tombstone. The cemetery had been built as a series of steps or terraces up the hillside. At first, I thought we were wasting our time. We saw nothing. And then, as we were swimming along the top of one of the terraces, some stonework materialized out of the gray water. This stonework consisted of a series of granite curbings surrounding a family plot. As I swam around, I wondered whose family plot was this? And then one of the divers discovered a name. The name was Underwood. Francis Underwood was one of the most famous residents ever to have lived in this valley. He had published a book describing life in Quabbin that was really a history of the town of Enfield. To find his family plot on a very first dive into the cemetery was just unbelievable. Along the sides of the plot, we discovered the remains of a shrub, a shrub that had been planted by some mourners in the past. When the common cemeteries were cleared out, 
it is generally said all the tombstones were moved to the new cemeteries. Obviously, this find indicates that this was not so, that stones were left behind. In this particular case, we found a couple of stacks of 19th century marble tombstones and on top of those tombstones were fragments of slate tombstones that were even older. Not far from the stack of tombstones, we discovered the remains of a road. This road led up from the church into the cemetery proper. Along the road, you could still see the granite posts with their iron bolts. This was the road on which horse-drawn hearses would have carried coffins from the church to be buried on the hillside. This pedestal at one time may have supported an obelisk. Now the pedestal wears just a veil of green algae. Farther along, we saw other remains of monuments scattered on the bottom of the reservoir. Bits and pieces of granite from other tombs. Pedestals that had been broken off and occasionally, we would just see a lone granite shaft sticking up through the sediment. In other places, we found just scatterings of granite blocks. These again probably outlined family plots, piled up ready to move and then just abandoned. Not far from this area, we found the remains of a wall. Above it, we immediately started running into fragments of marble poking through the sediment. It looked as though various tombstones had been broken up and abandoned. Everywhere we looked, we'd see flecks of white sticking out. Swimming along one of the terraces, we started seeing a lot of fish. We followed the bass and soon we found that the fish were congregating around a structure beneath the reservoir. This structure was large, about 50 feet long and 10 feet wide, and consisted of iron beams jutting out of the sediment. We think now this was a winter mausoleum. This is the place where bodies were stored. In New England, when the ground is frozen, it is impossible to dig. What was done in the past was to store the coffins in a winter mausoleum. Then when spring came and the ground thawed, the graves were dug and the coffins buried. Besides hampering funerals, the winter season also brought deep snowfalls that isolated the valley communities. Travelers relied upon horse-drawn sleighs. In 1873, the relative isolation of the valley communities came to an end with the advent of the railroad. The valley became linked to the rest of the country. Both ideas and people traveled the rails. The train was affectionately known as the Rabbit, possibly because it covered the 50-mile route in a series of very short hops. The short distances between the stations meant that the train stopped almost every three miles. Sometimes the train stopped for other reasons as well. My mother went to Athol High School, and uh, she went on the train. She'd go on the train in the morning, come back to the train at night. One spring day, the girls got together, talked to the conductor, and asked to stop the train so they could go out and pick some flowers for their teacher. He did. He stopped the train. They ran out, picked some flowers, got back on and on. They, off they went. The engineer was able to make up the time, so uh, things were a little easy back in those days. With the coming of the railroad, the valley changed. New industries developed, 
based on the area's most abundant natural resource, water. The Swift River Valley was known for its beautiful lakes. In winter, when these lakes froze, crews cut the thick ice into blocks for shipment on the railroad. Sometimes the ice harvest filled over 300 freight cars. The valley's rivers were dammed in a number of locations and small industrial centers developed. Mills and factories fueled by water power produced straw hats, textiles, and piano legs. The forests on the hillsides were cut to make charcoal. The railroad linked this commerce to the outside world. The old rabbit train made its last run on June 1, 1935, ending 62 years of service. In the months following its closure, crews pulled up the tracks and leveled the stations. Divers searched for the depot in the lost town of North Dana. The plastic jug will serve as a buoy to mark the site. The water pressure slowly crushes the jug as the divers swim deeper and deeper. Underwater, very little remains of the beloved rabbit train line. On the old right of way, a diver finds a rail spike. The depot hides beneath 60 feet of water. Perhaps its destruction was so complete that nothing survived. The state police divers find something. Tying the line to a cement foundation, a diver sends the buoy to the surface. Nearby, a row of stones and some bricks outline an old foundation in the depot area. Broken roof slates stick up through the sediment. Of the old depot, very little remains, just some rocks and slates. Along one side of the stone foundation, wooden beams outline a rectangular area, perhaps all that is left of the platform in front of the depot. To reach the depot from the west, travelers crossed a stone and iron bridge that spanned the middle branch of the Swift River. The bridge may have been dynamited. Large granite blocks have fallen into the old river bottom. This site is a jumble of granite blocks and rusty iron beams. The bridge is now a mass of timbers and iron. I-beams, planks, all collapsed downward into the riverbed. Swimming up the side of the old riverbank, we found a granite post that marked the entrance of the bridge. This post still stands on the bottom of the Quabbin. Although it no longer marks the entrance of a bridge, now it's just a lonely monument. The river bottom is about 70 feet beneath the surface. We've been down there for over a half hour and it was time to come up. For a diver, the most important thing is to control the rate of ascent. This is where you can get the bends. A dry suit has a layer of air between the diver and the water. So as the diver goes up, this air expands due to the decreased water pressure. As this trap air expands, the diver will be carried up faster. A diver will check his depth and then press a valve on his upper arm. And this valve on his upper arm allows the air that is inside the dry suit to escape. Thus he reduces his buoyancy and slows the rate of ascent. Although weightless underwater, on land, the divers carry a 70-pound burden, so going from water to land is not easy. The divers literally crawl out of the water. North of the depot, a dam once held back the river. This dam supplied water power for the Crawford Mills, a cotton cloth factory. Exploring the North Dana Mills underwater was like discovering a labyrinth underwater. There seemed to be walls everywhere. The massive walls of these mill structures just went on and on and on. We could literally get lost in the corners as we went around one structure to another. 
Some places stairwells descended into nowhere. There was very little left of these mills except the stonework. But then in the actual floor of the mills, you could see where different kinds of machinery and contrivances must have been set up to do the work of the mills. Iron beams with bolts sticking up, disfigured by colonies of iron bacteria. And then the puzzling structures of ironwork embedded in granite blocks connecting different things. We could never figure out what these were about, but we found them quite frequently. The iron itself is all disfigured with colonies of iron bacteria. It almost looks as if pustules are developing on the iron. The iron bacteria are using the iron as a food source. They're basically eating it, for lack of a better word. Although the wooden factory buildings were leveled and burned, occasionally something fragile somehow survives, like this china bowl. We couldn't help but wonder who left this bowl, who put this bowl on top of the foundation. So 60, 65 years ago, someone, the last person perhaps, that left this mill complex laid this delicate bowl on the foundation and the waters of the Quab and slowly buried it. You could see where the mills themselves had used the Swift River to dump their waste. These waste pipes are located all along the mill structures. They were using the Swift River as a means of waste disposal, which is really not unusual in New England mill towns. The riverbanks served as convenient places for garbage and industrial dumps. The riverbank fulfilled the primary rule of waste disposal, out of sight, out of mind. The towns of the Swift River Valley followed this practice of riverside dumping. In North Dana, as in other areas of the Quabbin, divers have discovered tumbled accumulations of rotted cans, old bottles, broken jugs, early auto tires, and rusty iron machinery along the submerged riverbanks. To archaeologists, the long-forgotten piles of refuse represent time capsules of the valley's history. But to environmental scientists, the submerged dumps raise concerns about seepage and long-term contamination. We discovered the dumps beneath the Quabbin Reservoir quite by accident. Along the banks of the Swift River, above the town, we ran into this enormous pile of bottles, rusty cans, horseshoes, old equipment, wheel hubs, and old tires, all sorts of material dating from about the turn of the century. We had inadvertently discovered the North Dana Town Dump. All this rubbish is just scattered along the riverbank for about 70 feet. This garbage was probably buried when the Quabbin was constructed. But because the rivers of this valley still flow underwater, the dump has been eroded and exposed. I must admit, when I first saw these things, it was appalling. I kept thinking, why is this material at the bottom of a public water supply? Visually, the dump assaulted me, but did it have any real public health consequences? My feeling is, it probably doesn't. Probably because of the volume of the water. The Quabbin works because of the audacity of its builders. They made it very, very large. And by making it very, very large, sites like this, like this dump, have a very small impact, primarily because of the dilution factor. 400 billion gallons of water is a lot of water. Consequently, whatever leaches out of this dump, which is buried beneath the waters of the Quabbin, is not measurable when we look at the water that comes out of the Quabbin. But again, when you find something like this beneath the reservoir, it does give you quite a surprise. A call for help interrupts exploration of the reservoir. Fisheries biologists conducting a salmon and lake trout census have snagged their net on the bottom. It is caught on an obstruction 80 feet below. The biologist asks if the dive team will cut it free and save the net. Blake Gilmore, the head of the Massachusetts State Police dive team, has the responsibility of going to the bottom of the net and freeing it. It is a dangerous job. Underwater, in the darkness, the net is invisible. It is just as invisible to the divers as it is to the fish. If you become snagged in the net and, in your twisting and turning, pull the regulator out of your mouth and can't retrieve it, you've got a minute or so to live.
As Blake goes down into the blackness, cutting the net free, he is not alone. Safety divers hover above him. These divers have the responsibility that if Blake gets caught, they must cut him free. The net has been cut free. It had been snagged on an old stump. A catch of lake trout and landlocked salmon is hauled up. We will measure and weigh each of the fish to determine the relative weight, the size to weight ratio for each year class. We'll also take stomach samples out of the fish to see what they're eating, to see if there's a change in their foraging behavior. And periodically we'll take scale samples, which we use to determine the age of the fish. After we've done our counts, we have a, a significant number of lake trout to uh, deal with and to dispose of. If we find a, uh, an eagle nest with young, active young in it, we'll leave three or four lake trout near that site for the eagles to harvest. The rest of the fish we take back to our facility and freeze them, and they're either given to tufts when they have a an injured eagle or osprey to feed, or they're used to provide winter food for the eagles at Quabbin when the reservoir freezes over and uh, food supplies are very limited. Besides fish, other interesting creatures like this newt live in the reservoir. Mussels inhabit the sediments, filtering food particles from the water. In an area near the flooded town of Enfield, a population of a rare species of freshwater mussel is thriving, whereas many populations of this species in other New England waters have declined almost to zero. Within the Quabbin Reservoir, we were fortunate to find an example of a special concern species, one of these rarer forms. And this particular species is called Elasmodonta undulata. This little freshwater mussel, as you can see, is only a few inches long and it's oriented in the substrate something like I'm holding here, except be this portion of the animal that is below my pointer would be in the substrate itself. And it would be anchored by this muscular foot and kept in position. If it had to move at all, the foot would do all the movement. So above my pointer, you see the animal, is, what you see of the animal is that portion which would be exposed above the substrate. And it's the business end, so to speak, because there are two openings in this organism. There's a lower opening right here that I'm sticking the probe into, and that allows water into the organism. And it's carrying with it food, oxygen, and it is circulated within the space in here that's concealed by these valves. The gills are aerated, food is removed, and transported up to a region at the anterior portion of the animal where the food is ingested. Wastewater then is passed to the upper portion of the animal up here. It collects excrement and other sorts of waste products and passes out another little chamber right through here. And that's basically how these organisms live. We rarely see these things anymore, in this part of the state anyway. It is probably a relic, to some extent, of a former stream fauna that flowed in the area. And a surviving a population managed to find a little niche or a place to hide and hang on in the Quabbin Reservoir. This animal has probably lasted or held on in Quabbin Reservoir because of the nature of the quality of water. Quality water in Quabbin is considerably better than surrounding streams and lakes anymore. And it probably enables a lot of these sort of rare organisms, including our freshwater mussel, Lasmodon undulata, to survive. Freshwater sponges are common throughout the Quabbin. On one dive, a rare species of sponge was discovered. The divers were able to go down quite deep water and find an interesting species of freshwater sponge that had always been traditionally considered rare in the region. And this is because most of the collecting and surveying that had ever been done was done in shallow water near shores. No one ever went into deeper water. And in this circumstance, divers brought some of this up and it turns out to be this quite rare species, Corbomyenia everett eye. It's an interesting little species because it was originally described from Gilder Pond in the Mount Everett Reservation in western Massachusetts. And so, in a sense, it's our little freshwater sponge. But it has been seen very rarely since then. But since the diving operations in Quabbin Reservoir, we now know that it does live in very deep water and it's fairly common down there. So that's one of the nice benefits you get out of this type of survey work, this type of exploration. During the underwater exploration of the Quabbin Bottom, 
Samples were collected on almost every dive. Sometimes, interesting organisms were scraped off of rocks. In other instances, sediment samples were collected for analysis in the laboratory. One such sample yielded a surprising discovery. Another interesting creature that was discovered by diving in the Quabbin Reservoir was an interesting little worm, a polychaete worm. Polychaete worms are very rare in freshwater. They are typically marine organisms. There are very few species which are adapted to freshwater environments. This one little species called Manunchia speciosa, which was originally described from the Schuylkill River in Pennsylvania, has turned up from, in different times from lakes and ponds throughout northern North America. We never expected to find this thing in New England. There are no historical records of it down here, at least in southern New England. And this remarkable little animal is probably only about five millimeters long, and it lives on the bottom, typically in deep water. And of course, this was the situation in Quabbin Reservoir. The tentacles you see would extend from the tube, and they represent the head of this worm. Tentacles on this uh, particular animal are very interesting. They are used to filter out food. Food is channeled towards the mouth, which is at the base of the tentacles. So they are, in effect, filter feeders. You can see the intestine extending along the length, heading up towards the mouth region, again, where the tentacles are, are positioned. And look at, the, again, the swimming-like movement of the parapodia. Again, the animal believing that it's in a tube and wondering why it can't go up and down. Quabbin Reservoir is an artificial lake, and we would not expect to find this creature in a situation like this. But lo and behold, one of the divers came up with a bottom sample of mud. Students in my course were going through it, and at the very time I indicated to my class that it was very unlikely you'd ever find this sort of organism, one of my students revealed one. And we all looked at it, and it was a live little specimen of Maniunchia speciosa. We were thrilled to find this sort of thing. We were able to videotape it while it was still alive, which I believe has not been done before. It's a remarkable little discovery. We're clueless as to how this thing might have gotten in there, but it's living there. The finding of a number of rare aquatic species in the reservoir was at first a puzzle. The body of water is only 60 years old. How did these rare species get here? The answer may be in Quabbin's history. In the past, the Swift River Valley was known for its beautiful lakes. Perhaps the biodiversity of these lakes has been preserved in the reservoir that flooded them. As the water rose, the animals in these lakes escaped to live and flourish in the new reservoir. The Quabbin provides drinking water for over 2.2 million people. It preserves 81,000 acres of land and water, the largest tract of open space in southern New England. The Quabbin Reservation is without doubt the most important natural resource in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yet we still know very little about what is under its waters. We look around the Quabbin and we see nothing but beauty. But what you're looking at is really something that was a human tragedy, a human tragedy of enormous proportion. There are towns, villages, schools that had to be destroyed. There were cemeteries where the graves had to be open and the bodies removed. When you walk through the Quabbin Wilderness, you'll see a stone wall or you'll see a foundation. And the stone walls are beautiful. They're clothed with vegetation. The foundations will have ferns growing on them. These now are more rock gardens. They, they give you no impression that people lived here, that people were driven out of here. In other words, on land, nature has healed the Quabbin. Underwater, the tragedy of the Quabbin is still there. Because nature has not healed it. The ruins of the buildings, the ruins of the schools, the desecrated cemeteries, all of this material is just laying open. It's as if the event just happened yesterday. When I left, it was, it was no big deal to me because I was only a kid. And uh, there was a new event, adventure moving to Belchertown. And I didn't think much about it. But now I think about it because uh, I think about the fact that I can't take my kids and my grandchildren, even my great-grandchildren, back and show them where I lived. It, 
It isn't there. And I feel bad about that. I would like to take them, take them swimming in the old swimming hole or uh, boating on Quabbin Lake. And uh, that bothers me now. I suppose it changed for a lot of people. They were uprooted. And uh, that doesn't happen today. The old folks were very upset, very upset. They, uh, it was like taking every, all their life away. One of the great, great people that came out of Quabbin was Eleanor Schmidt. I asked her what she thought of the Quabbin, the whole picture. She said, I, I have two beauties. I remember the beauty of the way it was and the beauty the way it is now. <laughs>